um, say good morning to everybody. Thank you for being here, um, especially to those who are from time zones that are still quite early. Um, it's now uh, midday in Sydney, Australia, so um, I'm well and truly um, awake. Hopefully, uh, my presentation in the next hour or so will be fascinating enough for you to be um, um, mentally um, engaged. Um, I do want to thank Arian for um, organizing this event. Um, as he said, um, he often would call me and consult me on a number of ideas. And um, I, for me, there's never a silly idea. I think, um, you know, a passion for learning and um, an interest for research um, is always something that is worthwhile to pursue. And I think Lisa yesterday mentioned about the beauty of having an interaction with intergenerational scholars. And I think it's always uh, good uh, for the younger scholars in the room to actually find somebody who's more mature in scholarship in the field and pursue them and seek their guidance um, so that they can help you along the way to uh, carve a pathway for you. Um, it's my extreme privilege to be um, consulted uh, by Arian and other younger scholars. And um, so, yes, so it's, it's a privilege to be speaking at this first uh, winter school for migration linguistics. So I'm just going to share uh, my screen um, and try and help. Okay, so, um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about, I've titled my topic, uh, Language Ideologies and Beliefs that Shape um, Heritage Language Maintenance in the Diasporas. And I have pitched the title of my lecture more generally, although as you will um, realize in a minute, I'll be speaking mostly about Filipino, the diasporic community of Filipino migrants in Australia. But I hope that as I do, the principles and concepts that I'll be using to explain the research that I have been doing resonate with some of your experiences, uh, regardless of uh, your uh, countries of origin and countries of destination. For those two of us who um, have migrated and have settled in different places um, around the world. In the next hour or so, so, hopefully less than an hour, I will be talking about, sorry, that's the wrong start to it. Um, let me just, okay. um, I'll be speaking um, about three main things. Um, and firstly, I shall set the scene um, and explain to you specific concepts um, that um, I will be using in this lecture. Um, and then I will uh, talk about um, the trends um, of migration globally and particularly in Australia, uh, because that will help us as well understand um, the research studies that I'll be um, sharing with you. Um, the second part of the presentation will be uh, focusing on, will be focused on relevant social linguistic concepts. So social linguistic concepts that impact on migrants' trajectories and settlement relative to language. And then um, the third uh, um, part of the presentation, um, I will be sharing findings from research that I have done since 2009 and looking at language ideologies um, that impact um, Filipino migrants in Australia, and how are those shaped by uh, beliefs and ideologies from both receiving and sending countries. And I shall end uh, with some um, discussions on implications of these findings to um, social linguistics. So um, the term diaspora um, comes to us from the Greek, uh, two words, uh, dia and spiron, um, to means to scatter across and initially used in the Old Testament um, in the Deuteronomy to refer to the dispersion of the Jewish people beyond Israel. Since then, however, since that historical account of its um, initial use, um, diaspora has been 
used um, in less uh, pejorative ways and um, simply refers to the spread of a people from their original homeland. And so think about the different um, uh, countries in the world where you have come across different pockets and communities of people that have settled um, in um, their migrant nations. So uh, Rockledge, for instance, have produced um, uh, a number of handbooks and um, it's understandable. They have one of the Chinese diaspora and Indian diaspora. So they are the biggest populations in the world. And so these two first handbooks account for um, various um, um, language issues and other issues, cultural issues that have they have come across in their settlement in other countries. And then the third one to the right, the Rutledge Handbook of Diaspora Studies uh, cover um, methodologies and frameworks used to analyze um, um, diasporic communities and um, the participants therein. So uh, the other concepts that I'll be using um, quite heavily in this lecture are notions of language attitudes, beliefs, and ideologies. And I just want to define the terms for us so we are all on the same page in terms of uh, what I'm talking about. So uh, language attitude in particular uh, was created by researchers in the second half of the 20th century um, and as a way of providing a means to treating speakers' feelings and ideas about various languages and linguistic forms as the critical factor in understanding processes of language change, language and identity, and uh, language in its socioeconomic context. Um, in particular, language attitude comes to us from social psychology and is often um, used in with quantitative measure uh, through the tools of survey, uh, much guys test um, and samples. And these are based obviously on individual perceptions of social identities. Um, so you would have heard, for example, of the classic Rubin study from the States, uh, which was a match guys test where um, uh, first year university students were made to listen to a lecture while looking at an image of a Caucasian professor. And in another occasion, another set of students were also made to listen to the very same lecture, but this time looking at an image of an Asian looking uh, professor, and they were asked to um, actually reflect on the test, the much guys test, their attitude towards the lecturer. And I think uh, I don't need to tell you uh, the results, so I don't really have time for that in this talk. But what you're probably thinking of and guessing in your mind is essentially the correct one. And perhaps in the question and answer, we can discuss that. Language ideology, on the other hand, comes to us from anthropology and is a qualitative measure and employs interviews and conversational interactions um, and looks at social actors in a political economy. In other words, uh, people engaged, participants, um, who are interviewed for these very studies um, see themselves as cited within um, the larger society, um, participating as part and parcel of the larger economy. Personally, um, I make the, these, this distinction. So in terms of language attitude, I find um, that this is uh, quite often uh, personal and has personal implications. So how I feel towards languages, my languages have personal implications for me and for the immediate people within my sphere of influence. Language ideology, on the other hand, um, has societal implications, as I will show you um, in a minute. Um, and, and perhaps uh, just to kind of get you thinking, think about the, um, currently we've, we've um, reintroduced the um, English language test for citizenship in Australia. So uh, that's the kind of language policy that is motivated by a language ideology that has social, societal implication in terms of who do we allow as uh, acceptable migrants into the country, for example. <clears throat> 
Uh, Silverstein uh, defines language ideology as sets of beliefs about language articulated by users as a rationalization or justification of perceived language structure and views. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that, so for instance, again, uh, with the English language test for citizenship, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you pass or get a score of eight in the IELTS test, that you will be a good Australian citizen. So the perception of a good language, and that's what uh, Silverstein's definition refers to, Pillar um, in her article on language ideology in 2015 talks about language ideology as being best understood as beliefs, feelings and conceptions about language that are socially shared and relate language and society in a dialectal fashion. In other words, they feed uh, into each other. So language ideologies undergird language use, as I will show you uh, with my participants' responses to their language and their language practices in the home. And these, in turn, uh, shapes language ideologies. So uh, what are the trends of migration globally? And I talk about this in this um, book chapter that Arian uh, referred to that I've contributed to Suresh Kanagaraja's um, Rotledge Handbook of Migration and Language. And in that, I talk about uh, colonization, globalization, and internationalization of higher education as the three uh, largest contributors to um, um, escalating migration trends globally, particularly to um, obviously um, rich, um, often Western countries. And uh, from the World Economic Forum, um, as you can see in the graph, the global trend in migration um, continued to increase. And obviously that stopped at 2019 and the last two years, obviously, uh, the pandemic has um, disrupted that trend and, um, and it continues to do so as well. So, and uh, the interesting thing here is that um, there's almost an equal number of male and female um, moving uh, globally. In the, and, um, but as one can um, understand and logically so, uh, the uh, 74 percent of those are uh, within um, the 20 to 64 years old and um, I can argue um, mostly in the um, uh, younger end of that range. In terms of migration into Australia, just to give you a context, um, so what you're looking at here is the graph of the overseas born population in Australia uh, between 1901 and 1971. Now, the key thing here that uh, you have to keep in mind is that within this period of time, Australia was still under what's called the white Australia policy. And the white Australia policy is um, very much associated with the dictation test. And the dictation test essentially looks like this. You want to come into Australia, you sit a uh, language test. It doesn't necessarily have to be English. It can be any language that the assessor decides uh, you, should dictate, uh, you should write as he or she dictates. And obviously, um, it was clearly a very much a gatekeeping mechanism. And so as you can see in the graph, um, within those uh, years, uh, 70 years, um, you have largely white Europeans coming into Australia. And then the shift, of course, takes place in 1975 when Australia, when the Australian government um, replaced the white Australia policy with what was called the multicultural policy, not multilingual, but multicultural policy. So beginning to introduce laws that allowed for non-white, non-Europeans to come into the country. And so... Um, Many decades later, so this is based on the 2016 um, census, um, you can see how although the UK is still predominantly the highest um, contributor of migrants into the country, followed by New Zealand, you now have quite uh, a diverse range of non-European countries contributing to the increasing population of the country, which is at 25.69 million 
And so you have China as the third, for instance, and then India as the fourth, and Philippines as the fifth. Um, that is, those statistics are more or less mirrored in New South Wales. I'll show you a map later. So Sydney is in um, the state called New South Wales where I live, and um, the five top contributing countries into the migrant population are also China, um, excluding um, SARS and Taiwan, and India, England, India, New Zealand, and the Philippines. Um, so much so, so there's actually quite a rich of migrants um, throughout Australia. And just um, based on the 2016 statistics, I just want to show you an interesting uh, graph published in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, so what you can see there is, is essentially um, um, the dispersion of languages across, so this is the map of New South Wales, and what it shows you, um, the different colors refer to the different uh, languages, so there's about 250 languages spoken in the homes in Sydney, and so that's how um, multilingual so this is in the survey, you're asked what language other than English is used at home. And this is reflecting the responses to those, to that question, which I will comment on later. The other uh, concept that needs explaining is um, heritage language maintenance. Essentially your heritage language or languages are the languages that you bring into the receiving country. So in my case, for example, I have seven languages. Um, and my English is obviously, uh, you know, something that I can easily uh, shift into Australian English um, when I'm uh, in different registers, like in the university or speaking to colleagues. But what research shows um, for Australia and actually globally is that my first generation migrants, as represented by this caricature of an older woman, comes into the country quite strong in their heritage language and uh, with English. But then the second generation migrants um, keep their heritage language, but is more dominant in English. And then the third generation migrants um, almost often lose their heritage language and simply maintain English. As an example, a colleague from Sydney Uni, Nina Rubino, whom Lisa also knows, um, did her study in 2014 amongst Italian migrants, Sicilian, Australian migrant, and her findings showed that the first generation uh, were still quite strong in their Sicilian, in their Italian, and obviously also has English, but their children were mostly dominant in English with knowledge of Sicilian and Italian, but the grandchildren actually lost um, their heritage languages. And so, and that's just an example of um, the trend that I was sharing with you. So now let me um, focus on the relevant social linguistic concepts. So often when we talk about social linguistics, we talk about, um, I hope you talk, you think of Labovian kind of social linguistics in terms of, you know, how social constructs, gender, geography, age, and so on and so forth impact uh, language use. Um, in this particular segment of the lecture, I want to talk about um, uh, five specific concepts that are impacted by those um, social factors, but I'm going to use them as well when I present the findings um, in a minute. Okay, so these are the social con the social linguistic concepts of linguistic repertoire, uh, language policies, um, language practices, language ideologies, and language hierarchies. And I'll explain them to you uh, relative to the Philippine setting and the Australian setting. And again, for those who might come from other countries, I hope that the concepts or you can relate the concepts uh, relative to your own um, social milieus and experiences. So let's talk about linguistic repertoire. So as most of the Philippine scholars in the room and other colleagues would know, um, ethnologue reports uh, that the Philippines has about 183 languages, so distinct from each other. Um, and um, the image that I'm showing you right now reflects the um, 
10 dominant languages and um, the geographies where they are uh, used predominantly. In Australia, um, English is the de facto national language. So now we're in the constitution does it actually say that English is the official language, but it just is, right? So it's just, uh, that's just been the way it is. So it's not de jure, it's not in the law. It's just being practiced. Um, there are Aboriginal languages um, and there is Australian sign language and there are community immigrant languages where which as of the last census, uh, 2016. So in Australia, we have a census every five years. So 16 and 2021, so it always falls on uh, years ending in six and one. And um, the 2021 uh, results have not quite come out yet. And uh, Felicity Cox, who is a colleague at Macquarie University, together with her colleagues also identified what she refers to as an ethnocultural Australian English, essentially a kind of Australian English that is influenced by the heritage language of the speaker of that particular variety of English. And so um, it's important to understand that these are the, this is the specific linguistic repertoire of the kinds of participants we'll be talking about in a minute. In terms of language policies, um, as you know, um, the Philippines have gone through various language policies. I think Dr. Madrunio, uh, who is an expert on the topic, is in the room um, and can add to this perhaps in the Q&A. Um, and I'll unpack it in a minute. Um, in Australia, it's a largely monolingual ideal. Uh, but as you can see, these are some images um, that you would see when you walk around in any center, any city really in the, Australia. Um, and so you will have lots of signage um, that reflect the um, migrant languages present in the various suburbs, right? So you've got on the image, you've got Korean um, and Greek and um, Chinese, um, and you can have many others as well, depending on which suburbs you go to. So um, in the Philippines, you have, uh, you know, various um, indigenous languages present before the Spanish and American occupation. And then, of course, we have the American, uh, the Spanish occupation that uh, predominantly influenced um, the language, particularly of the church. Um, and also the language of the elite. As we know, um, that wasn't necessarily a language for the masses, uh, but more for the aristocracy. And then the 1898 um, uh, occupation of the Americans, first by the soldiers present, and then the Thomasites that established um, the uh, great University of Santo Tomas, brought in um, English and implanted the official uh, presence of English in all our systems, education, law, and um, business. And then in 1936, you have the establishment of the Institute of National Language that was um, instigated, that was um, um, asked to come to agree together on national language and also official other official languages. Therefore, in 1987, you have the articulation in the constitution of uh, the following languages, Filipino as national language and Filipino and English as the official languages of communication and instruction with regional languages um, allowed to be officially used as auxiliary languages as, um, in the media of instruction. And then, of course, you have the bilingual education policy, and more recently, in 2013, the introduction of the mother tongue-based multilingual education. So these are the language policies from which uh, migrants, Filipino migrants into Australia come from. Um, in terms of language practices, and, and, and just in terms of um, the Australian policy, um, I'll talk about um, the various changing ecology, but in terms of policy, it's largely really just been uh, English, right? Um, there are attempts, um, and unfortunately not quite um, 
you know, often well thought of attempts to introduce uh, migrant languages in primary schools, but often that's dictated to by uh, the highest number of migrant population in a particular suburb. So for example, when my children were in primary school and we lived in a suburb called Ride, um, they learned Italian because uh, the highest uh, migrant population in that particular suburb were Italian. And obviously that's, you know, that constantly shifts and changes um, with the going and shifting of um, various migrants to various places. Um, in terms of uh, language uh, practices, so um, language practices um, are influenced by um, for the Philippines, for example, um, your level of education, right? And also the kind of uh, school that you go to, so whether it's private or public. So as we all know, in the Philippines, there is much privileging of the English language when you go to private schools. Um, and often that becomes a motivating uh, factor for parents um, to make a choice as to where they send their kids to school. Socioeconomic status also um, often um, can tell uh, what language practices are being practiced in the home or amongst your social circles, geography. So um, um, I think um, uh, what is true in the Philippines is that the further you are from the urban center, so the more rural you get, the more multilingual one can be. So the more you are in the center, uh, the more bilingual you are in English on the um, main language of the region. And then of course your say, social network also dictates language practices, um, social network, um, but also professional network, where you work, what languages are required from you, um, and then, of course, your network um, also um, influences your attitude towards certain languages. Right? Um, and as I said, in Australia, um, it, there's generally a public monolingual ideal against the widespread de facto multilingualism. Um, so use um, titles like this, right, um, still persist um, in the media. So new migrants living in cultural bubbles need to improve their English skills. So there is still a um, quite a, um, you know, a dominant um, uh, publication of opinions, particularly from politicians um, that continue to tout um, the monolingual mindset, despite, as I said, the widespread um, multilingual reality on the ground. Now, language ideologies, I, I'm not sure, and I, anyway, I'll have a look later if she's here, but yes, last night on our cocktail meeting, um, this is my small group where we're talking about um, with Dr. Madrunyu and her daughter Kay and Kinichiro and Noor, and um, I wanted, I asked her permission to, if I could use this image, um, and Noor was telling us that where she comes from in the South, uh, that there's still quite a resistance from the teachers about Philippine English and that there is an insistence on their part uh, that American English be taught. And we had this interesting discussion in terms of what she thinks you know, uh, should be done. And I pointed out to her a lot by asking a question, are there Americans around in, 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 I think, Zamboanga, uh, so much so that it necessitates for you to identify American English. And, and so there are different ideologies, and I don't really have time to cover a lot of them, but I'm sure you in the audience are thinking of different ideologies that influence the way you think about the languages that you have. And if I were to give you an exercise right now of, to hierarchize your language, um, precisely the language ideologies that you have that have been mostly influenced by your structure, that means your education and your social um, milieus um, will actually um, affect how you um, um, number or you know, how you put your languages in order, which ones you value most and less. Um, in Australia, um, Joe Lobianco, uh, 
from Monash um, has written in 2008, um, various um, ideologies. And, but these are not uh, set in stone. These come in flux and they change they change depending on who's in power. So I'll talk about um, them very briefly. I've um, hyperlink Asianism, for example, which uh, links to a video on Julia Gillard, um, who was uh, Prime Minister of Australia around 2012, I think. Um, um, but uh, let me explain each one, right? So Britishism is an ideology um, that is present in some pockets in Australia that essentially harks to uh, the motherland, if you like. So, you know, this notion of keeping uh, British English because it identifies our trajectory as coming from the United Kingdom. Australianism is the opposite of that and tries to essentially create an identity that is unique from the motherland, if you like, and um, is aimed at establishing um, this identity um, that is separate from um, the UK. Uh, multiculturalism um, is recognizes the presence of um, the different migrant population groups throughout the country and seeks to um, acknowledge their presence, but also the importance of keeping uh, the languages of those migrant groups. Um, Asianism um, and the relevant link that it's hyperlinked to, um, but I won't show you because um, I don't have the time, is essentially of um, whoever sits as prime minister dictates the kind of languages we think should be privileged and taught in our schools. So this one is of Julia Gillard at the time talking about uh, the importance of the languages within um, close by to Australia. So the teaching of Indonesian, Japanese, uh, Mandarin in schools, for example, and all towards uh, the recognition of the relationship we have with um, and did I say Japanese as well? And uh, all we, uh, the relationship that we have of our migrant, of our Asian neighbors. And economism um, focuses, brings the focus back to English and how um, English is a strong um, uh, feature of Australia and actually um, is a great source of our economic revenue with a lot of international students, well, up until before the pandemic coming into the country um, to study uh, because of um, English and other reasons. And so these are the kinds of ideologies that uh, shifts and changes and have at some point um, throughout Australian history um, influence um, the kinds of language that we use or we privilege. Um, language hierarchies. So language hierarchies, um, again, um, is based on the notion from the, um, the great um, um, author um, Abram de Swan. And um, here we talk about, um, you know, the valuing of languages, right? So um, the dialectal relationship between language ideologies and language use. So for example, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, um, for instance, the requirement for an English test for incoming uh, new applicants for migration into Australia is a language ideology that then dictates the privileging of English amongst those uh, who needs to pass the test. Right? And then that language is in turn, once you sit the test and you get your citizenship, of course, you um, then uh, take pride in having done that. And so it then, you know, they have this dialectal relationship as they would, that then becomes a motivator for uh, precisely keeping the ideology of English, uh, mostly, if not only. So let me talk about uh, three research. Um, so I've selected three of the research that I've been doing since 2009. Um, and I'll talk about um, each of them. And then I'll talk about the findings relative to those social linguistic concepts that I've just been talking to you about. So um, the three research were done in 2009, um, which was the 
um, I shadowed migrants into Australia and I'll explain who they were. Um, particularly, I've uh, taken, I've reflected here a photo um, that is uh, used in an article in Language on the Move that features the study. And then 2017, uh, for those young scholars in the room, particularly the women, um, I do, uh, this is important for me. Um, you might see there seems such a big gap and there is. And um, essentially when we moved to Australia in 2004, my children were very little and my husband and I, I made a conscious decision that my first priority are my three children. And so there was a big gap of me focusing on raising our kids because we have no um, family here. We have no extended family. Um, and that's just one of those um, uh, gendered labor that we don't really get to talk about in the academy, but I do want to just uh, make a comment on that because it's, it's important too. Um, and then of course, once the kids finish and they're in university, then I'm able to go back to my academic work. And so in 2017, um, I did another study, this time simply using census data from 2016. And then more recently in 2019, um, I did a research with Filipino migrants family in Sydney. So let me talk about each one. So uh, the Filipino skilled migrants in 2009 was a study that was funded by a Macquarie University New Staff grant. And it allowed me to shadow uh, Filipino skilled migrants who were under what was then called uh, the 457 visa, which some of you may have heard of or otherwise known as the temporary long stay visa. And there were three cohorts that I shadowed. Um, one cohort, which is reflected in that photo were the abattoir workers in Queensland. Um, and then in South Australia, um, in each site I went for a week um, and I shadowed and interviewed uh, prefabricated home workers um, that were mostly building prefab homes for, um, for the mining companies in Australia, and then the system IT workers in New South Wales. And the qualitative, qualitative data collected included a social demographic profile, quite extensive, and a semi-structured interview with all the participants. Um, the key findings, and I here I'm gonna use the social linguistic concepts that I've introduced to you and discussed with you a while ago. Um, so in terms of linguistic repertoire, the skilled migrants that came or come into the country from the Philippines are multilingual speakers, right? They have different languages. They come into the country with different languages. However, the language policies in the workplace, unspoken, it's not actually written anywhere or it's not, they're not oriented to simply use English, but there is a prevailing monolingual mindset in the workplace um, that dictates or at least makes my Filipino participants feel and assume they can't use their language in the workplace. Um, and so in, I'll sh share with you a couple of the publications that have been um, done. Um, um, based on this and those detail in particular, um, the um, specific um, expressions from the participants. And I can't go into the detail because of time, uh, but essentially uh, um, an example, for instance, is one of them, um, her pseudonym is um, Ellen and her English is an She's not very highly proficient in English, which is perfectly fine. She works in an abattoir. She can communicate, they can understand each other. Her grammar isn't perfect. She doesn't teach English, that's perfectly fine, right? However, she is very conscious of that. And so, um, especially when the colleagues who are Caucasians are present, she ensures she does not shift into Tagalog. And so for abattoir work, if you can imagine, it's like, um, you know, it's a it's a very tedious work where you're always standing up and they, it, it's timed work. So there's 
person before you and the person after you. And the work that you do is dependent on how fast they are and how fast you are for the second person. And so the banter in Tagalog often happens as a kind of reprieve, but she's very conscious that she sh her colleagues and she should not be doing that because in her mind, it's embarrassing for the Australian um, colleagues. Um, the other finding from that um, in terms of language practices is this notion of language shaming, which Ingrid Pillar has written in the Language on the Move website. And also this acceptance. So there's, there's a sense of discrimination against them when they speak another language, because the assumption is that they're speaking about their colleagues. But what's interesting to me is that they accept this and they actually almost imbibe and have this self-discrimination that they're not, they're in the wrong if they are to also, you know, be heard speaking their heritage language. Um, and, and language shaming. So it's almost kind of like, you know, in this twilight zone, because if they speak English, their English isn't very uh, proficient. And so there's a lot of error. And so they're embarrassed to be fully participating. But at the same time, they feel they can't really use their um, uh, Cebuano or Tagalog or whatever it may be. One thing that's really, really interesting for me in terms of language ideologies is that the language trajectories, okay, the ideologies of the sending countries to so this the Philippines are reified here. And so, for example, um, there are speakers of other languages in amongst the participants, but most of the time they speak uh, Tagalog and they're embarrassed to speak their other languages. And they say because the other colleagues are mostly Tagalog speakers. And so they're, you know, they, it's the one that's assumed to be shared by all of them. And so to me, it kind of reifies the um, language ideology and the, um, and the hierarchication that we have looking at the national language policy that we have in the Philippines, where you have obviously Filipino and English as uh, put up in um, you know, the top of the hierarchy and then the other languages um, and I'll, I'll show you how this is also repeated in this other study in census data. And of course, the international English language testing system, uh, which is a requirement for them to actually take permanent residency. So we heard Brenda, Professor Yo, yesterday talk about how in uh, Singapore, for um, some uh, kind, uh, some uh, labor migrants, that's not really a pathway for them. So in Australia, it can be. But the thing is, you have to gain a specific score in your IELTS to be able to be considered uh, for your permanent residency application. And again, um, this um, focus on um, achieving a specific score in the IELTS has a knock-on effect in terms of how they feel towards their um, heritage languages. And um, it also impacts what they actually practice at home, which I'll show you in the third study. So um, all of uh, that particular project um, has uh, resulted in these um, publications, um, particularly the last one in the list is um, in Multilingua and is actually an open access. So if you haven't, if you're interested in what I've shared so far, uh, feel free to access that. And then if you're um, more recently, um, with um, colleagues from um, Switzerland, um, we've uh, produced a special issue in the International Journal of Bilingual Education on Bilingualism and Speak English, uh, Social Acceleration and Language Learning in the Workplace is also based on that study. The second study um, is, was done in 2017. Um, and I wanted to see well, how are Philippine languages represented in Australia through the census. So as I've said, every five years we have this census. Um, so, um, and to investigate the presence of uh, languages in Australia. And for me, my interest is in Philippine languages and this chapter has appeared in this book, uh, Multilingual Sydney. 
I'll just show you a portion of the census data. And unfortunately, this, near, this doesn't really change in the recent one in 2021. The question asks, does the person speak a language other than the English at home? Okay, so yes. But the thing is, you can only mark one box. So it's a problem for me. Um, I have other languages. I speak other languages at home when I'm on the phone to my relatives, uh, speak Hiligaynon or Cebuana. Um, and, and, but it doesn't, the survey actually doesn't um, allow you to show that. Um, also, you'll be interested to know, and I will note this in a discussion in a minute, is notice how uh, only eight of the 183 languages um, that we have in the Philippines are ever present, represented in the 2016 census. And notice the duplication of, if you like, of Tagalog and, and Filipino. Um, for those of you who are not familiar in the rooms, Australia um, has um, states and territories. So we have um, seven, right? So, so five states and two territories. And, and essentially, this is where I am, New South Wales, and leads us from here. And I think James as well is originally from there. Um, and so um, in the study that I did based on the census, um, I uh, work with a human geographer from Macquarie University. And we looked at the dispersion of Philippine languages in the greater uh, New South Wales area, so not including uh, this part here. So just uh, from North Coast, New England, Western New South Wales, Hunter, Nepean, and Southwestern Sydney. So not including South Coast. And you can see the dispersion of Philippine languages um, in that greater uh, metropolitan uh, New South Wales. So the darker the shade, the more presence there are of Philippine languages. So they're quite out in the West and Southwest, right? With bits of pockets um, um, in near the Sydney area. So this is Sydney. And so you have a few up in the Northwest. Um, and so the key findings from this study is that multilingualism is silence in census, right? As I've shown you in the question. Uh, language policies in the Philippines impact how Filipino migrants think of their languages and um, I've interviewed in the next study some of the participants and I asked them about how they answer these um, questions. And it's very interesting because if they have a language that is lesser known, um, they don't actually report it. So they report the national language, which to me, again, reifies the language policy in the Philippines. Okay? Um, and so it shapes the way they value or not the languages that they have. So again, um, there are multilingual practices in the home, but the reporting is largely mono or bilingual reporting. So it's just English and Filipino or English and Tagalog, despite the fact that you could very well be easily uh, practicing other languages, particularly if you think of transnational connections, right? Who you call in the weekends, uh, your grandparents and your relatives. And as I said, policies reify ideology. So one whose mother tongue or whose heritage language is uh, Warai, I ask her, what did she put as the language other than English that she uses at home? And she used to put Tagalog. And I said, why not Warai? And she says, well, nobody knows what it is. So I didn't put that, but everybody knows. And so again, this, you know, the, the, the valuing of Tagalog in the language policy in the Philippines and the devaluing of other languages is, echo, is echoed here by some of the participants. So lesser known languages are valued less. And then the final research project I want to talk about um, uh, was grant, uh, was funded by the Australian Linguistic Society in 2019. And it allowed me to interview six families, uh, Filipino migrant families into Sydney. Um, the requirement was that they had a focal child in primary school because that was important to the point of my looking at heritage language maintenance. How well do they keep um, their Philippine language? 
Um, they've been at least in Australia for a year. And two of the six families came from Luzon, two from the Visayas and through from Mindanao. And so for those non-Filipinos in the room, these are your large regional um, categories of the Philippines where you have Luzon on the north, Visayas in the middle and Mindanao at the bottom. And this is motivated by the expectation that all these various uh, regions um, mean that the speakers will have different language repertoire. Um, I collected quite a number of qualitative data here, including, again, a very extensive social demographic profile of the participants, but also um, semi-structured interviews. So um, my PhD student who has now finished and who has returned to the University of Santo Tomas and is also mentored by Dr. Madrunio uh, Pia Tenedero. Dr. Tenedero was my research assistant for this project. And so I interviewed the parents and she interviewed the children. Um, and then we collected sample conversations of the family um, and around dinner table conversation. And then the family with their best friend and the child with their best friend and also with their transnational family. And um, some, a few of the key findings I want to share. Uh, skilled migrants, again, are multilingual speakers. So they come with quite a number of languages up their sleeve. Uh, the language policies and practices, um, particularly the family language policy varies um, quite a bit. So there are those that try and maintain English mainly or only. There are those that try and enact uh, what Romain talks about um, as one parent, one language policy. And there are those that think of their family language policy as English only until, and they're very specific, the child um, is seven years old. Um, there's, and then there's, there are those who um, do English in the home and um, relegate the learning of other languages with their transnational families. And what I find in these, um, in these uh, practices is that um, the language ideologies are um, very much guided by an economic ideology. So one father, for example, decided, so he, they speak Cebuano and English. But when he, they came over, I'll, I'll be brief about this story. When they came over, he decided that his English wasn't very good. It wasn't up to scratch to how he needs to make, how it needs to be in the workplace. So he came home one day and he said to the family, right, from this day, we are going to use English. And it was essentially his strategy to improve his English with their children, and they have three children because it's a low stake, um, you know, social space. So he's not going to lose his job. He's not going to speak English well with the children. But also um, some of these language, family language policy is guided by a false belief on uh, or an erroneous belief on principles of language acquisition. So most linguists in the room know that um, every child, um, you know, has no limit in terms of their mental capacity for learning languages. You can learn as many languages as you want. The key to um, the key to retention, obviously, is the quality of the input and also the opportunity for language use. So. Um, these are some of the results from that study. Um, and these have been presented at the 2019 Australian Linguistic Conference, and these are now under consideration um, as, a as part of a special issue with my colleague uh, from the department, Dr. Hannah Torsch, uh, with Multilingua, um, focusing on uh, family language policy relative to heritage language maintenance. And so hopefully um, that would be um, considered for publication later in the year, if not early next year. So let me end um, in terms of some of my musings in terms of implications for heritage language maintenance. And this is just kind of bringing them all together and some of you know, my, my thinking. National language policies must recognize the value of all languages. Right? So if we keep on harping on the importance only of a select uh, two, um, you're bound to um, you know, uh, 
communicate the, the lack of importance of the other languages. Multilingualism can be the norm. The key is that we must pay attention to the quality of input and the experience. So the one family, for example, that employs one parent, one language, I pointed out to them that it's important that the father is actually there. So the dad decides to speak Cebuano and the mom decides to speak English, but often the dad is away. So, you know, so there's an imbalance of input. And so that needs to be um, remedied. Um, the benefits of multilingualism are many. You know, we can have another hour of lecture on the many benefits that the literature has established. Uh, you know, from Canada, Bialystok and the team have established and written a lot about the executive control and how, um, you know, having two or more languages enhances our cognitive um, uh, control. Um, it has health benefits, so it's been written not just by academics, but also in the New York Times of how um, having multiple languages delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, mental well-being, particularly for the migrants in Australia in their old age. Can you imagine when you're old and you have nobody to take care of you in the in old people's home that can speak your language? So um, it's been established, obviously, that if there is one that does, um, it enhances significantly your mental well-being. Um, if you have uh, literacy in one language that builds and helps a lot in your literacy in the other languages. Um, I don't know in the Philippines and in other parts of the world, but certainly in Australia, there is great economic reward for having many languages. And then the various social cultural uh, benefits of it too, not just the transnational communication that you can maintain uh, but think about your language as an expression of your childhood upbringing. Without that language, you know, what do you remember? How can you remember? So language is not just a tool for communication, but indexes one's identity, who you are, right? And think of it language not just as a, you know, this, this kind of monolithic thing, but it's it's a complex, uh, you know, uh, characteristic that, that includes the way, the sound that we make, the words that we use and the grammar that, uh, that we employ. And please remember, everyone, everyone has an accent. Just because other dominant speakers, more powerful, more economically well-placed than you tells you you have an accent that they don't, everybody has one. Uh, one of my favorite readings is by um, uh, Rosina Lippi Green, who uh, published a book, English with an Accent, and one of uh, the dedication that she wrote in her book is this. It's dedicated to my father, whose accent I did not hear. So thank you for your time, and um, I guess we can now open the floor to question. I'm sorry it took uh, 